Hello, friends. Welcome to another edition of the Tennis and Bagels podcast. This is your host, Vanj, and joining me today is his author, writer, journalist, Hall of Famer, historian. You guys know him very well. We do this after every major. It's Steve Flink. Hey, Steve. So, uh, you know, what are, what are your sort of overall impressions of, of this uh, this U.S. Open? And it's always a pleasure to to do this with you after every one. Now, well, back at you, Vanj. I, I enjoy it every time. But uh yeah, you know, overall impressions. I thought it was pretty uh, exhilarating uh, from beginning to end. You know, Coco Goff's run, the scare she had from the first round on, all the four three setters, and everybody following her every move because she would had such a great run leading up to the Open. The the battle for supremacy among the men, and all of us anticipating it, pretty sure even before the semis, frankly, that we were going to get Djokovic and Alcaraz, which we did not. We had the Medvedev surprise, but I thought, you know, the little reemergence of Sasha Zarev, although he didn't play well in the quarters, he had a, a, a really gritty win over Sinner. So all tall, and then, of course, ultimately, the the uh, perseverance, the indefatigable Novak Djokovic coming through again uh, in, a, in, in what was a really almost impossibly physical match against Medvedev. So uh, I just think there were many, many highlights. Probably, I, I left the last one, the last one I put at the top of the list because he keeps climbing through history and that's number 24. And yes, we talk about the comparison to Margaret Court, but I, I don't think you really can compare it. And that's no knock on Margaret. What she did was phenomenal, but it included 11 Australian in, with some weak fields. It's really, I don't really think you can compare the two beats. I think you have to compare Djokovic, obviously to Nadal and Federer and all the great men and to now be two ahead of Rafa I think he's in pretty safe territory to finish at the top of the men's list and stay there for a good long time, may- maybe forever. Yeah, I certainly think uh, he's going to be at the top for a, for a very long time. And obviously, he was the oldest U.S. Open champion as well. And this is yet another season where he's won, you know, three of the four majors. And, you know, if you had told him at the start of the year that you were going to get to the finals of all four and your only loss was going to be a five-set loss to five-set loss in the Wimbledon final and you were going to win the other three finals in in straight sets, I'm sure he would take that. He would take it, and then he would make a joke about, but do I have to lose the five-setter? Can't you give me that one, too? Because that's what makes him so great. Yes, it's the fourth year that he's won. No man has ever done that. He did it in 2011, 2015, 2021, and now. it's that's People don't realize that's, that's an extraordinary accomplishment. Roger Federer in 2004, six and seven did it, but this is really... A phenomenal achievement for Djokovic, and I agree. He, the season started. He, you know, he probably hoped he could get two. Uh, he, even though he's so uh, immensely ambitious, uh, he tries to be realistic. But of course, it, it helped that he got right on top of things in Australia and rolled through that field, and that, uh, and, and then obviously adds the French. And it, we'll never know how he would have played here had he been able to beat Alcaraz because he gave himself those chances and had that set point for a two-set lead and had the break point for a two-left fist-set lead. So there were two really golden opportunities for him. But I, I think, honestly, in my view, Raj, he won this. He was helped by losing Wimbledon because he didn't need to come here again and try to wipe out the Grand Slam pressure out of, out of his mind and deal with that again. And I think he would have dealt with it much better. And, and we have talked about this. And I think he may well, I think he probably would have come through. But this, I think, made things slightly easier to just focus on the open. And the second point I want to make is that I was at the Ivanisovic press conference. And Ivanisovic talked about how you could tell he didn't go into it, didn't really, wasn't expansive, but he alluded to the win over Al- Alcaraz at Cincinnati and felt that it was very important. And I do too, because I think it was a big psychological lit to deal. He didn't want to come into the open with two straight losses to Carlos, and particularly what would have been a heartbreaker in Cincinnati after already losing an excruciating contest at Wimbledon. So that was a very, very uh, important win that bolstered him coming into the open. So just remarkable. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, obviously, his biggest test on the way to the final was actually in the third round. Uh, albeit yeah. he lost, yeah. you know, he lost the he lost the first two sets, and as soon as he broke right at the start of the third set, I was thinking, oh, this is over. He's he, he's he's winning this in five, and uh, and and it was very similar to his sort of other two set comebacks uh, against you know Musetti and Sitsipas and then Sinner last year at Wimbledon, and 
it was it was very reminiscent of those in, in that, you know, once he got the foothold at the start of the third set, you knew that he was just going to raise his level and it was going to be impossible for the other guy to, to get one more set. Yeah, Vance, that's interesting. I just want to add one thing to that. I think you're 99% right. Only thing I'd add is that, yeah, the Musetti match, once he turned it, it was a romp, and Musetti had to retire, I guess, four left down on the fifth, whatever it was. It, you know, it, this one, and then Sinner, I never felt Sinner had much of a chance, as I agree, at Wimbledon. But this one, the fourth set was a misleading scoreline. I, I know you watched it. Yes. yes. Fun. They had some marathon games, and he, he, was, he would finally get the break after a, a lot of deuces. Jara, Jara really competed hard in the fourth i give him a lot of credit and then even after novak got the break early in the fifth and went up five to a, you know he made novak serve it out and there was a break point in the last game so he did have to go through some tension which he did a little bit in the fifth set of the sits of us roland garros final two i agree with you I, I didn't think he was going to lose but there was tension in the fourth and at the end of the fifth which i think did him some good you know that that and and it and it said a lot for his opponent that he competed that honorably as well i actually really enjoyed watching that match the fourth set was quite a tussle and it, it, he, he wasn't going to lose it no but the 6-1 he wasn't like a easy 6-1 the way the third set was without a, without question the third set was but it ended up obviously helping him because he didn't lose any, any other sets before or after in that tournament you know they were all straight set wins and in in amidst it all he, he benefits from a five setter yeah certainly i think it helped to uh keep his mind and his and his uh belief sharp uh you know that he could go all the way and and was it a you it was a bit of a mystery to me that in the early game early games of that match mm -hmm. 40 30 on his serve he doesn't hold break points in the next game he doesn't break second serve game for his opponent doesn't break I felt like he dug a little hole for himself that that you know that it could have been very different not that it was going to be an easy match because this guy really is terrific on the backcourt and shouldn't be the number 32 seed he's a guy that should be in the top 20 in my view playing like that but yeah. I, I was a bit surprised that Novak didn't bear down better on the big points in the early stages because that put him down a set and then you give your opponent all that extra confidence and he, he plays a great second set and you can't get into it and he just couldn't wasn't able to break him in those sets that was really surprising then of course he started breaking left and right after that but it was mm. it surprised me the way he started because he's usually very he's usually very conscious to try to build an early lead and making sure you get the first set because he's now you know he's got that 0.958 winning percentage like 935 and 41 in these uh after winning the first set he he knows how good he is after winning the first set so it did surprise me that he dug that hole and then that led to the difficulties in the second set yeah, certainly. That's a good point. It did surprise me as well, and I felt like he was missing some of that spark, just emotionally. Yeah, I was playing the good points. He wasn't emoting in the way that, you know, you would, you would see from him in order to grasp the momentum back, and uh, that that started to change later on. But I was surprised that it took him, you know, the two sets that it did. That's a very good point. You could see. You almost wanted to see him get a little angry. Because it, 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 some kind of emotion, it, it didn't even have to be totally positive emotion, but something where he was rousing himself, and that wasn't happening in the first two sets. And you could see the looks on his mother's face and his honor eyes, and they, and, and even Isvich, and they were all they were all as befuddled as as we were too. But as usual, you know, when when he has to step it up, he does, and that obviously that was a critical victory. It would have been immensely disappointing to foul in, in the third round of the open to a player that he should beat so good effort yep good effort for sure and then you know in the quarters you know i i certainly thought fritz came through his section very nicely and it was setting up it was setting up well and obviously they played each other in in cincinnati and it was pretty one-sided there and i just felt like it's a it's a really bad matchup for taylor and you know coming in novak already had the seven and no head-to-head and their only previous close matches were, you know, at the Australian Open when Djokovic had the abdominal injury, and then at the ATP Finals, of course, last year, a couple of hard-fought tie breaks. They're yes, and, and those are important to cite, Botch, because, uh, yeah, the one, especially the one, the, the absolutely true about him being injured, and he's in Australia, and he screamed out. They were playing with no fans by that point in Australia because of COVID, and 
And I remember that, you know, they had that, he literally just screamed like you've never seen him. He was so relieved because I think he was afraid that was going to get away because of the injury. And then he had to deal with it the rest of the tournament and he still won the title. But, uh, and then in the ATP finals, you probably recall, he played that long match with Medvedev the day before in the round robin, mm. tiebreaker in the third that he really wanted to win. And I want to talk a little bit about that, a little more about that later, because he, he said afterwards that Medvedev was one of his most important rivals. So he he treated a supposedly meaningless round robin match as if it was a final. And But I think was that was a bit still feeling the effects of that a little the next day, because he didn't play great against Fritz. Two tiebreakers, and he just, he just pulled himself together on the big points. He did just enough to get across the finish line, but it wasn't a typical effort. But this one was much more typical. You alluded to Cincinnati, six love first set in Cincinnati against Fritz in 21 minutes and comes back from 4-2 down in the second, wins it easily. And this one, yeah, this one followed a pattern of most of their matches. I mean, let's face it. I mean, Fritz is just, he's up against a better opponent and he knows it. And he talks about the importance of the first serve and, yeah, he, his percentage goes down because he's pressing a lot because he knows on second serve points that Novak is going to be pinning him back there and making a deep return and taking control of the point and he cannot stay with him in those exchanges. So this one was it was a solid effort. He had to work a little hard at the end because a fan screamed out when he was serving at four or three deuce up a break in that third set, two sets up. And he wasn't happy about that. It, it was apparently a Serbian fan trying to help. Him. He was really angry because the guy screamed out as the Fritz had kind of lobbed the return and it looked like it might go out and Novak let it go and then had a scamper back to the baseline and end up losing the point and losing his serve. But once again, you know, he breaks right back and serves it out. So that was, those were all important, Botch, because he was conserving energy, which in the end I think was important given the physicality of the Medvedev skirmish in the vinyl. So all of these wins, it was, I think he was very conscious each time. He did not want to be going for he wanted to, to be as efficient as possible, and he and he clearly was. Yeah, that's certainly true. And then in the semis, um, you knew that it was going to be an American, no matter what, and it was going to be someone of the Shelton, Paul, Tiafo, yeah, <laughs> ilk. And yeah. Uh, and it, 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 it ended up being Ben Shelton. But I want to talk a little bit about Ben. What did you make of his overall run to get to the semis? And obviously, you know, he got to the quarters of Australia, but then he went something like nine and nineteen, uh, you know, yeah, the rest of the way. But it was. Exactly what it was because I looked that up myself because, and it amazed me as I looked back over those tournaments, Vaj, to see how, how few matches he had won. I knew he hadn't won many, but yeah, I I was I was very impressed. I, I wouldn't, I, I'm sure you felt as I did. If, if someone would have told us that Shelton is going to beat, he's going to beat Tommy Paul and Tiafo back to back and be in the semifinals of the U.S. Open, and we would have said that's a stretch. I know I would have said that's a stretch. Not that he isn't yeah. capable of beating those guys, but that's two very good wins back to back. I guess I was a couple of things. Number one, I was disappointed in Tommy Paul's performance. He got a three love lead and 15 for get four break points. I guess one really easy forehand pass to go up four love and pretty much wrap up the first set, which he then loses. And then the next thing you know, he's down two sets to love. He, you know, Ben goes up four one in the third, and Tommy uses his experience to take that set, which Ben gets a little apprehensive. And then the, you know, finally at the end of the fourth at 4-5 four, is something of a tight game from Tommy. I just felt like he was the guy that, in my view, should have been in the semis. I, I, of, the, of that trio, I'm most impressed with him as a day-in, day-out, as a really solid, thorough, top-of-the-line professional. He was the one that had played, played Novak in the semis of the Australian. I thought he should have played him again in the semis here. All credit to Ben, though, because obviously that was really some stupendous serving, and he hit those two... 149 mile an hour bombs there, you know, and, and, uh, he really enjoyed himself. He's very exuberant on the court. He's very, uh, uh, freewheeling and experimental and, and, and that makes him exciting to watch. Obviously there's some, the forehand is very flashy right now. He needs to make it more solid and shot selection could be better off that side at times. But I'm very impressed with his back end. The backhand was very good in the latter stages against Novak. I like the, the back, and I like the fact that he can serve at very different speeds with different spins and use the wide slice in the ad court. It, it, you don't always know what's coming, although Novak did. Novak clearly did. He seemed to be able to pick every single serve first or second. He knew where they were going, getting a ton of returns back. He, I think that was one of the keys to that match being so, so straight sets was that Novak 
had a, seemed to have a play, have a chance to break almost every almost every time Ben served. That's pretty unusual for Ben. He's expecting to get through some easy service games. It didn't happen. All told, I'm impressed with him, Vaj. I think there's a, it, an enormous room for growth. He can get a lot better, but he there's a lot of natural talent, and uh, I hope that he'll use this this time. We, we, you just alluded to that record, that di- disappointing record post Australia up to the Open. I hope now from here to the end of the year we see some solid performances because he's put himself in a great position where he almost in, almost inevitably he'll be seated in Australia. But if he plays well, he could put himself into say a top sixteen seating. And that would be nice for him. All of this, it, it's all, uh, it's all in his favor. But he's, but I hope that we see good things from him at tournaments like that Paris Bercy event or some of the other. You know, he's going to get in anywhere he wants right now. He's going to be able to play the one thousand. It's all set up for him if he can take advantage of it. But obviously, he's he's not there yet. This was against the odds that he was in the semis. He took his chances. He did a great job. He beat two accomplished fellow Americans. Now let's see where he can go from here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think that the third set tiebreak, funny enough, against Tiafo, I think that kind of sums up Ben really well right now, where it's just, you know, he, he is one of the more, you don't know what you're going to get from him point for point, where, you know, you're going to get streaks of amazing uh, of amazing tennis because he's so flashy and, and he has a really lively, explosive arm. And then you're going to get other phases where, you know, he might make a shot selection error. He might go for way too much on a certain forehand. He might, you know, he might not, um, you know, get the, he might be going for the 149s and 148s, but he might, you know, he, he, he might, that might lower his first serve percentage or something. So I think, I think he's at a phase right now where he's still in the early developmental part of his, his, uh, his growth as a tennis player, but um, it, it was just so interesting to watch the third set tiebreak develop against Tiafo because he would, you know, he 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 hit he he he's up six four and then uh, in in that tiebreak and he does so well to get there. But then but then afterwards, you know, he throws in those two double faults and then he hits that amazing forehand winner off of the Tiafo second serve. Um, and then yeah, where he yeah, tried to get around just, it. At- where he's trying to get around it and not hit a backhand, and and so he's going to have to hit a forehand perfectly yeah. on the line. That was ridiculous, but yeah, that you're right. That was symbolic, definitely symbolic of, of Ben Shelton. You know the the highs and the lows. You know, yeah, he can't be two doubles from set point out, but he bails himself out from set point down. He also surprised me. I mean, part of it was I felt that Novak was a bit tight at the end of the Shelton match and the crowd was getting noisy and it was making him a bit uneasy and he hadn't served out the match with match point and he let him back in a bit after being 4-2. And now we go to the breaker and it's typical Novak on his way to 5-1. And Ben won the next three points and he did it by outplaying him for the baseline in some pretty good rallies, which... Again, the back end was terrific during that stretch. So he's definitely a good competitor, and and and, and with a lot of ability. Novak had to play two, had to play a really good point at five four in that breaker, which he did to come forward with a little drop volley followed by a nice little finesse back end volley that got behind Ben. But it's like I admired that because with yeah. or without a, a little bit of nerves from Djokovic, it was still that you know Ben could knew he could have been out of there. It would have been disappointing to him to lose, you know, 3-2-2 two, and two, or 3-2-3. Three, and three. Yeah, He made a go of it in the third and played that tiebreak pretty well considering how far down he was. But you're right. The one against Tiafo. Now, I want to add this. I, I, I was critical of Tommy Paul. I'll be a bit critical of Francis as well because yeah. he did not play a good first set at all. The first set was not very competitive. And then, you know, he gets back into it and then it, obviously we know how what a crushing blow it was to lose that tiebreak. But he's... You're a veteran. You were a semifinals the year before. You know, you're you're a top ten player at this stage. You you gotta compete a bit better than he did in the fourth. He was so subdued. I mean, we talked about Novak being a little subdued in that third round match that went the five setter, but this was Francis is the guy that emotes all the time, plays off the crowds. I know he didn't feel he could get them totally behind him playing Ben, but he still could have had them a bit more in his palm at times if he had he displayed his usual uh, enthusiasm, but there, he he was not himself in that fourth set, and that made it a bit easier and and 
good job from Ben to close it out confidently, but I didn't like the way that Tiafo competed. Your, your thoughts? Completely agree. Um, especially the fourth set, just how just how quickly that that finished and just, uh, you know, the poor start in the first, I, I felt like Ben just took over that stage in a way that, you know, I certainly expected he would, he would, he would match Tiafo or, you know, it would be, it would be a close kind of 50, 50 tug of war and it could go five because I just felt like they were going to have phases and lulls and then really highs and lows, like we saw in that third set tiebreak. But the fact that Ben was just able to take over that stage the whole night, I think it was really something unusual. And, and, and I think frankly, you know, I think, I think Tiafo and Ben and all these Americans are pretty close with each other off the court. But when they actually go and face him, I think uh, I think there's a, there's a dynamic there where, you know, because because Ben is relishes the big stage and he just he lo- he thrives in that in that atmosphere. Um, he he kind of overshadows the other guys, uh, you know, on the court with, with with how he emotes and how he celebrates and and things like that. And that's why I kind of wonder. Um, if some of that, you know, irked Djokovic as well in that in, in that semifinal meeting that they had, because uh, you know it's very common for it's a very common way of playing in like college tennis and celebrating and and showing that enthusiasm that he does. But I wonder if if Ben will start to scale it back a little bit now that he's in now he's now that he's on the pro tour and he's he's learning uh, while still keeping you know what makes him what makes him pretty special and attractive to the crowds. I think he will, Vaj. I think he will. I think I, I, it's not totally out of choice, but out of necessity, because he doesn't really. He's not. He seems like a nice kid. I don't think he wants to offend his opponents. I don't think he's trying to rub it in their face. That was acceptable in college tennis, you know. So he, there was, there were no issues there. That's how they did it. But I think he's learning because I really had the impression Tommy Paul was not happy about it either. Mm. Tommy's a pretty easy going late back guy and so it, they'll probably have some discussions with him about it because yeah. uh, I think they all do get along okay off the court and so you know that will over time that's going to change I don't have any doubt about it uh, it, it, it wasn't going to happen here amidst all of the excitement and exhilaration of the US Open but I think as uh, as the months move on as we head into next year that there'll be that we'll see a slightly different demeanor from Shelton without him having to just, without him having to just completely uh, change his personality. That's not necessary. It's just modifications. Yeah. And I, I do like the healthy relationship that him and his father have, um, you know, in, you know, in terms of, in terms of coach, coach and dad, I think they're able to really separate the two things. And then, you know, on the court, like, I don't think Brian is, is a guy who gives so much information to his player after every point And he kind of just lets Ben be and, you can see that you can see that off the court as well that he you know he sometimes takes a step back and then when it's necessary he steps in so I, I I like the dynamic that they have and I think that's going to serve Ben really well because he seems to have a good head on his shoulders and he takes loss as well. Yeah, I noticed that it's it's interesting you point that out because I was sitting a couple of the matches I was sitting our press seats kind of faced those seats where his father would, was so I'd watch him go over to his father and. You could see the whole tone, and then sometimes I'd look at the tape later and hear what what Brian was saying. And yeah, I think he's approaching it the right way. Don't overload him with information and try to get deeply tactical in twenty seconds. You know, just just encourage him, and he's handling it well. And Ben will learn. I'm sure Ben has heard a lot of this feedback about his behavior, and I'm sure he'll take it to heart. I'm sure he'll discuss it with his father, who again. I'm sure his father will explain to him what things were like for him on the tour, what he's observed about the tour today, and give him some good advice as well. It'll it'll sort itself out. I think he's going to end up being a popular with both the fans and his fellow players. Mm-hmm. I guess I'm cautiously ca- optimistic when it comes to his potential because I feel like another player that he reminds me a little bit of. I mean, they're obviously very different in many ways as well because Ben has. You know, I think Ben has a better head on his shoulders, uh, and I think he has a bigger serve. But he reminds me a little bit of Denis Shapovalov when he was first coming up in in, in you know 2017, and he beat Rafa yeah. and Drill in the, yeah. on that run at the U.S. Open. And you know, it's it, it's something about the highs and lows, and and of course both them being lefty and, and the similar type of way that they they construct points when they're at their best. It's a little reminiscent of that. It is. You're right. You're right. I, I, you know, I think back to the, that 
that nice patch he had off the back end toward the end of the Djokovic match, and other, and, and actually Chiapo as well. There were stages where his back end was very good. And I'm a little more encouraged about him. But obviously, yeah, you just never know. I mean, Djokovic played Chapovalov in the semifinals of Wimbledon a couple of years ago. He went up to him in the locker room and said, you know, I think he honestly believed that Dennis was destined to win some big prizes. And it's yeah. it has been a downhill slide since then. I, I, I get your point that we we need to proceed with caution when it comes to Ben, but I'm a little more hopeful. I, I'm, a little, yeah, I'm, me too. I'm hopeful that he's not going to turn into a Dennis. Yeah, I feel the same. Um, and then, okay, I guess uh, before we start talking about the final, we can we can talk a little bit about Medvedev and Alcaraz. Um, because for Daniil, you know, I, I was struggling to kind of gauge during the tournament where his form is actually at because I saw a lot of issues with his second serve, you know, all throughout the tournament. And I was just yeah. I yeah. was just waiting for that shot to click a little bit more because I've, I saw him, I was on the grounds in Cincinnati watching him practice that second serve you know, every day. And he was working really hard to try to get that, get that shot down when, you know, and it's still, he still never really had it all the way through. Um, but, but he had those comeback wins against, uh, you know, against Dimonor. And then in all three sets, he was down a break against Rublev and that sweltering heat. Yeah. And he, 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 he's set to play Alcaraz in the semifinal and Alcaraz himself only lost one set on the way to the, to the semis. But, uh, there was something about Alcaraz's game as well throughout the whole week where, uh, you know, like he was he was playing well and he was getting through these matches, but I felt like, I felt like throughout this whole summer, he's never really found the range on his forehand. And it was, it, it never looked, the forehand never looked as great to me as it did, like, let's say between Indian Wells and Wimbledon, where he was just winning all those tournaments and, and playing really well uh, all throughout. Did, did you get that same feeling? That oh, totally no, not. Exactly, exactly, exactly my take. Way too streaky off the forehand. I felt like the score lines were misleading when measured against how he was actually playing. Yeah. Uh, to back up your point at the open. So yeah. I want to say the Dan Evans match was really exciting. Like, uh, like, like I, I was impressed by Dan's effort to get back in that third set against oh, against Alcaraz no. when I thought he Dan, would fold. Sorry, sorry, Blanche. Uh, yeah, Dan would. Dan was playing. To the, uh, to the uppermost of his ability, and he and and it was enthralling for the crowd. But obviously, there are limitations there, and he has to rely on the slice back in so much, and his forehand can at times get shaky. No, I thought, but I I, I just didn't feel. For instance, I didn't think Zara played terribly well against. I thought Zara had a mm. chance in the first set against Alcaraz with great points at three all, and bundled them with with errant backhands, which is his best shot, and could very well have won the first set if he'd broken there. I no, I think Carlos was getting by on. It, it, I had I, I don't mean this harshly, but a bit on re, uh, reputationally. Mm. You know, it was like he, he is intimidating to play. That powerful personality and the, the, the athleticism and the way the crowds love him as well they should. And it it's uh, yeah, I, I wasn't that impressed with this form, but I still felt, I still felt that it. Uh, we watched. Come on, all of us saw him destroy Daniel in the Indian Wells final. And then Daniel says pre-Wimbledon, well, the court's different this time. I didn't get that much help on my serve. The court was slow in, in Indian Wells. And he, he came out and said that if he played his best, he was going to give himself chances to win. That was the right attitude going in, but I didn't see it during that Wimbledon semi at all. And I thought he was kind of humiliated, to tell you the truth, in that match. And I thought, wow, he does not look like someone who's vying for the top. What happened to the Medvedev that I mean, granted, the only loss in that stretch, that dominant stretch that started indoors for Medvedev in the winter eight to the spring was Carlos in uh, in California. So, But still, he was so good in that phase and so good in Rome. But since Rome, he had not been very good, starting with the, the first round loss in Roland Garros. And yes, he got to the semis of Wimbledon, but I was never that impressed. Yeah. All the, all, I still, so I, I didn't feel like he was going to win. I just felt okay. I'm not. I don't think Carlos is playing that well. But this matchup is a nightmare, and it, it's going to be that match is going to be won by in straight sets by Carlos. That was my feeling going in. So I really have to say I sat there kind of stunned and impressed at the same time by what Medvedev was doing because not only did he put the brick wall back up, which I didn't see in the previous matches with Carlos. I don't think he relied enough on his usual formula. Saying okay. 
20 shots, 30 shots, how many do you want to play? Every one of mine is coming back deep. I dare you to find a way to disrupt me. Plus, serve big, serve to the corners, be deceptive. Everything came together. The serve was excellent. He lost the serve once in that match, and that wasn't until early in the third. And and uh, he, he, he had the wide serve working really well in the ad court, going down the tee nicely in the deuce court. Everything was there. And the forehand was so penetrating without missing it much. So I, I think he, he definitely caught. Carlos later alluded to that forehand, how surprised he was by it. I think that was one of the keys. You know, steady as can be, but aggressive. Mm-hmm. Controlled aggression. So I, I thought it was amazing. But I will say, Vach, that I didn't understand that Carlos's second set collapse. I mean, you lose a yeah. tie break first. On serve all the way into the breaker. You had a c- couple of chances early to break, couldn't convert, fair enough. But then from three all in the breaker, I think he's a little hard on himself. I don't think he, I don't think all of those points were his fault. He missed a volley that he would normally make, but, uh, you know, and, and he goes down 5 3 with that. I, I look, I can see why he's disappointed because you fought hard and you wanted to be up a set. But usually he's so good at digging in again after losing a tight set and just, you feel like, okay, he's going to make this guy start all over. And I expected a really good second set win or lose from Carlos. We didn't get that 6 1 and, broken a couple of times and just looking lost out there. And Daniel just put his foot on the accelerator and was sensed it, saw it, and took full advantage of it. And before he, you know, so he just coasted to the two-set lead. And in the end, that was catastrophic for Alvarez. Because although he revived in the third and got that break to go up 3-1 in the in the third and and rode it out, uh, he put himself in a, in a very serious spine by being down two sets. You know, he hasn't made a two set to, to love come back from, he hasn't come back in two sets down yet. Yeah. I'm sure he will in his career, but it's a very hard way to win a match. And uh, second set to me was actually the key to the contest. What do you think? Yeah. Uh, I think it just fell apart in his mind uh, when he was, uh, strangely enough, at 3 all, like Daniel double faults. And then at 3 all, he misses that yeah. backhand drop shot inside out. And he misses that yeah. in the net. And yeah. It's very strange that you see him miss a drop shot by that much and and make that kind of a decision. Normally, he's so, you know, he wins a high percentage of those drop shot points. And I just felt, I felt like in that moment, he lost his mind a little bit. Then he missed the volley. And then he just carried over to the second set. I think that was the most disappointing thing about his performance is, is the carryover. And he wasn't able to, to kind of reset. And I think he was just startled and puzzled and as shocked as we are. Because I think he expected, quite frankly, I think he expected him himself to to win that match and he went in as a favorite and I felt like that was playing on his mind a little bit and he didn't quite have the answers to to come back and I and I also just think you know the his tactics of the serve and volley and the 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 serve plus one and the the ways he was toying with Medvedev in Indian Wells and Miami it just wasn't working to to as great of effect because I felt like Daniel was returning a lot better he was uh he was taking a few steps to his right and anticipating the white serve better on the deuce and I don't think Alcaraz hit his spots nearly as well as he did at Wimbledon and at Indian Wells so I think that was that was probably part of the reason I, I think he still had a, quite a bit of success doing the serve and volley but it, it just failed him in certain key moments and I think especially yeah. Ford said a few too many times he did it on the ad side I understand doing it on the deuce side but there were just many times on the ad side where he just where Daniel was just very ready for it and I, I feel like it it caught up to him uh, at the he end. also moved it. He moved it around a lot in the deuce court. I didn't quite understand that. Why? Uh, I don't care if Daniel let him move a little bit, a couple of steps over. But I still think he get it really short and wide. He's in from that far back. Daniel's in trouble. Even if he's, he's just not going to make that many of those. I was. I, I didn't quite understand the location of some of those yeah. first serve, uh, the serve and volley from from uh, Carlos in the deuce court. And you're right. In the ad court, you got to be very selective about doing it over there. So, yeah, he maybe a little too much in that game that, that put him down 4-2 in the four, and that was critical. Give all credit to Medvedev, though, in the sense that he fought off the three break points early. He could have gone down a break in the four that he yeah. was very tough in that corner. And then how he persisted in that long seven-deuce game to finally get the break mm-hmm. and go up 4-2. Then, of course, he reverted a little bit to the uh, schizophrenic Medvedev, he stirred out the match. That was, yes. you know, uh, there were some strange moves there and going for that 126 mile an hour second serve. He did some weird things 
but he still managed to hold on. And I frankly think he deserved the win. Uh, you know, he had outplayed Carlson, but but had he had he blown that game bunch, I'm not so sure the whole match might not. I'm not so sure he wouldn't have gone down in five. That was that was a yeah. very dangerous moment for him. Yeah, you're right, and especially the one-all game, the way he saved those three break points because yeah, Alcaraz yeah. missed a lot, but then the way he was able to. The backhand volley, for instance, that was really impressive. And then the 125 mile per hour second serve into the body. So those three points. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Very gutsy. I thought were... Very gutsy. Yeah. yeah. That was the right time, too. I, I liked it there. I thought that was the right time to to roll the dice a bit. And, you know, he had another 122 mile per hour second serve that won him a big point. He was, he was, uh, yeah, he was thinking clearly most of the match until he served for the match and he got a little bit frenzied there. But, uh, yeah, he started save those break points beautifully and and then finally gets the break for four two. No, it was a good four set because by then Carlos had the crowd uh, you know t- almost entirely on his side and they were they were thirsting for a fifth set. There's nothing they would have liked more. And Daniel was getting a bit perturbed about it all. Uh but in the end, it, 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 yeah, it was a stunning performance and the best match he's played in a long, long time. One that will still help him despite losing the final. I think Daniel needed a win like that over Carlos after everything that had gone on post Rome. So, you know, he'll he'll probably finish the year pretty well. I suspect we'll see some good showings from him between now and from now through the year end championships and and then he can, you know, we'll, we'll see what he does next year. But I'm expecting a, a pretty good year out of Medvedev in twenty twenty four. Yeah. Uh and, and, you know, I think at at times this year uh, it's it, it it's still tough to know like what to expect from Daniil week to week. Like he, I, I still find him one of, one of the more enigmatic top ten players. Even though even though he's he's won as much as he he has and he's had an illustrious career, especially on hard courts. Uh, it, it's it's just it's just kind of tough to know where he where he's where he's gonna go because he wins he he has that amazing run at the start of the year and he wins those five titles. And then he doesn't really cash in on it at the French Open, and then, you know, his his lead-in tournaments weren't great coming in here as well, and then things could have gone differently, uh, you know, or spiraled in a way against, you know, I wasn't very impressed when he played O'Connell and when he played Baez and those th- those few early rounds, and so I was very yeah. I was very pleasantly surprised by this win, by this win overall. Yeah, it, yeah, I agree. Know, it was totally agree with you. Totally agree with you because normally he would have needed a better summer, which is why I was not optimistic. So I remember seeing the draw and thinking, well, you know what? We'll see if he even gets to Carlos. And, yeah. and I thought he might lose to Demonor going in. And so, yeah, uh, it, it, he gets a definite lift out of this tournament. I mean, he made the comment prior to the final that it was going to, you know, that the difficulty of winning a match that big against Carlos and then having to play that final. And he knew how Novak was going to want to avenge that loss in the 21 final. And it would be hell to lose it or something along those lines. Uh, true, but I still think he'll, take, he'll feel pretty good overall about how he did. Uh, sure, he yeah. would like a second major, but you, you got to feel for him a little bit because he's now in the five. He just can't avoid these guys in the finals. He's always playing rapper or Novak. And, and he manages to beat Novak once, but he's lost two two major finals to Djokovic and two to Nadal. And the two to Nadal, as you know, were both five sets. One, a gallant comeback at the Open in 19, where he's two sets down and pushed it into a fifth before losing. And then to be up two sets against Rafa in the 22 Australian final with that love 40 opening in the third to go off a break. I mean, that it, you know. And then to even break back at the end of that match against Nadal and make it five all a fifth and have a chance to at least get into a tie break and lose his serve again. He said so... Those things must haunt him a bit, uh, but uh, he still can feel, I think, pretty good about this tournament, all things considered. Yeah, and I, and I just think going back to that semifinal, like he was just so ruthless and like mentally present uh, at every single point. You didn't see the usual venting to his box or like the, um, you know, the desperation kind of gestures that he that he normally has or, or like phases like the back and forth between him and his coach. I felt like he was just locked in for every point and so focused in a way that I haven't seen, you know, three out of four, five sets against that big of a scalp, uh, you know, at the end of at the end of these majors. Like, I, I think it might be his most impressive major performance. Like, he's obviously had some blowouts and he's had some some great wins along the way, but I was just so impressed by this one. 
I put it right up there. I agree with you. I put it right up there because I felt like I, I just felt like in in that twenty one final with Novak, it was a very very tightly wound Djokovic. He just yeah. was not really himself, and and all credit to Daniel for exploiting it. But this was different. This had a different feel to it. You're so right about the metal, the the the, the outlook and the metal toughness and the bearing down and not needing to look at his court. It was all there. He did a great job. Didn't panic when the third set got away, and also made sure that Carlos didn't. Had another love 30 there. He could have lost the service second time. Didn't allow that to happen. So he came in the fourth feeling like he could do it, which he, which did happen. And yeah, it, it was, you know, it was one, it was one of the best performances of his career to be sure. And we'll, we'll see where, where it leads, you know, post open. Yeah, for sure. And then, and then on Alcaraz's side as well, I thought his press conference was very mature afterwards uh, in a, in a way, like, you know, I think it was a little, maybe a little over hard critical of himself but i feel like his his overall sentiment was was really good and i feel like that's the kind of attitude that shows why he's such a fast learner in a way and how he was able to figure out grass so quickly and i sense that during the indoor season we'll see much better results from him just because i think he'll be so determined after this yes yes i think so i think so i mean i don't think he's gonna be in the doldrums he's a he has a very positive outlook he's very good at dealing with losses we saw that i mean it Rolling Garros to Wimbledon to recover as well as he did there and win at Queens and win Wimbledon after, you know, that severe cramping in 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 against Novak and Roland Garros. So yeah, I think so. I think he's going to do well. I think it's. I hope he doesn't overplay. Mm-hmm. Uh, and but he'll be eager. He, he, you know, he he takes all these tournaments seriously, despite the fact that he didn't win one over the summer. I don't think it was that he was taking those tournaments lightly. I just don't think he found his game. You said he didn't find his range off the forehand. I completely agree with that. It was never really fully there in Canada, Cincinnati, or the Open. So, um, yeah, I expect some good things from him. It'll be interesting to see if he wants to make it a big goal to hold on to the year-end number one ranking and do that for two years in a row. And it'll be tight now because Djokovic is in the lead. And that might be one of his a motivational factor for Carlos to try to conclude the year at the top but you certainly don't want to see anything happen to him like we saw last last autumn which was not which yeah. was bad luck but to get hurt against Luna in Paris to miss the year-end championships in Davis Cup to miss then hurt again and missing the Australian Open at the start of this year those are the things he wants to avoid and there was taping on his leg at the Open you saw that yeah that was obviously precautionary because we didn't get a trainer or any sense of pain from him but it, it concerns me about how that could act up at any time. That seems to be a weak spot in his body. That seems so. I just feel like they've got it. He's got to schedule carefully and make sure that he gets enough rest, and then hope, hopefully, with some luck, he can avoid the injuries. Yeah. Do you think in that match against Medvedev, he was just uh, he was just in awe of like Medvedev's pace and how much? how much harder and faster he was hitting the ball because I feel like his forehand cross-court, Medvedev's forehand cross-court and his backhand down the line were, were major keys to winning that match. And I just feel like every single time Alcaraz tried to tried to be so over, overly aggressive also because he, he likes to hit those running forehands a lot cross-court. And, uh, and he was just trying to get them, you know, he was kind of playing into Daniil's hand a little bit from the baseline. And I feel like that's why he overdid the serve and volley so many times. Uh, at at times of that one game in the fourth set, because I feel like he just was struggling to win those baseline points because yeah, Daniel I, redirecting and going changing directions down the line off both wings so well, and he his eye was muddled. Yeah, he wasn't expecting that. To, he wasn't expecting what Daniel produced to be thrown at him that way. He definitely wasn't expecting the pain. I think he was less surprised by the backhand than he was by Medvedev's forehand. Because Daniel can lean into that back end and hit it with great pace up the line. That he's very capable of that. But he did not. He he felt like in the previous matches he was not threatened at all by Daniel's forehand. So that that definitely caught him off guard and may have. But in, but again, he had Guerrero giving him all this advice throughout the match. So you know you have to wonder was part of it Ferrero's fault too because he's he's giving him constant tips. Uh, whatever he could between points. So I, again, that Ferrero seemed to want him to go forward a lot, particularly in the two-three game in the fourth. So 
Yeah, I think you're. I think you assessed it well, and it, and I think it 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 threw Carlos for a loop, and he wasn't able to think his way past it. And maybe he should have gone more than. There are times he tried to use the slice back in, but he, he also could have played things a little differently off off his forehand, a bit of willing to sort of back off it a little bit and make keep Daniel working as well. Daniel played it on his terms that match. Yeah, definitely. Um, and then, and then I guess uh, talking about the final, uh, obviously the bulk of the match was the second set because an hour forty four minutes and Djokovic had to dig so deep. Uh, you know, when he was struggling physically at, at times, and it just felt, you know, it, it, it felt like Daniel's plan was, okay, I can outlast him here. You know, I can outlast him in these long baseline exchanges. And maybe that's how I'll get my upper hand in this in this match. So I was very impressed by uh, by Djokovic also in the tie break, but also in, at certain points in that set, the way he was able to dig himself out of those, out of those holes and play those brilliant points. Um, you know, especially his his touch at the net and just how great he's become. I, I mean, he's just, his volley just continues to amaze me every single, every single passing major that he plays because it's, it's become a real strength, like his net play. Yeah. And never, never better than that day in my view. That, that, that was probably his, his best display considering that he, you know, he's serving a volleying 22 points and he wins 20 of those that had a huge winning percentage at 37 of 44 overall yeah. coming to that. And that tells you everything. And that that meant, you know, of course, the standout moment for me on, on, in that department was the break when he saved at 3-4 in the second when he served in volley, then he was well behind the service line because it was a great return from Dane and he makes the half volley angle drop cross court and he raises his arms to the crowd. Yeah, it, 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 his, te his technique is better. His countless, this is, it's everything. It used to be, I felt like his best, trait at the net was how well he anticipated the technique was good but it was more that he, he, he Becker had helped him to sort of learn how to what how to anticipate up there now I feel like even when he hasn't necessarily anticipated that the technique comes through for him and he could do things that he could never have done before or even two years ago on the volley so it's yeah it was that was that was one of the chief reasons why he won that match I think what was his play in the forecourt was so excellent but Look, here's the thing about that second set. I mean, the first set, is I know you saw it a bunch. It was interesting. You mentioned about Medvedev in the second serve and watching him practice it in Cincinnati. Yeah. Here he is at this opening service game serving that wild double fault. And you say, where is that coming from? This is not a pressure moment. What is he doing? Yeah. Djokovic breaks him at love. But great. You know, Novak House, good for him. But that was basically the set because Djokovic was having... Very little difficulty on serve, no break points faced, and he did it. You know, he really controlled matters on his own serve without getting a high percentage. And the thing is that when he plays Medvedev, and Daniel standing so far back, even for second serve returns, that's a nice luxury for Djokovic and all the other top players to feel like I don't really have to do anything that special with my second serve. He's not going to pressure me. He's going to make the return, and he might even make a pretty deep return. But I don't have to feel overly threatened. Uh, if I place the second serve, well, it doesn't have to be that deep or that perfect. And I think Novak, I don't think the double floss that Novak started serving had anything to do with being intimidated by Daniel. I think it was just his tension and fatigue at that point. It was different psychological factors, but it wasn't worrying about what Daniel might do with the return. So I, yeah. but I think a couple of things. One, first time. The first three service games of the second set were all lump games for Djokovic, his, his, his three. Daniel was really struggling, as I know you noticed. Yeah. And you know, they, these were deuce games, and finally at, at three all, he had deuce games, then one 15 30 game, and then finally a, a break point in the three all game that Daniel did a terrific job of saving with a great 124 mile an hour first serve that set up a swing volley. So up until Novak served at 3 4, I felt like he had been by far the better player in that set. But then that's when things started to, I don't know what to say, get inside his head, but he would start maybe feeling the effect of not having broken and wishing he had it. That was that long game, three, four deuces there at three, four, and he made that spectacular half volley that we just talked about. And, uh, but finally gets through that game. And, you know, it was fascinating from there because Daniel was pretty unruffled in this phase. He comes back with an easy hold, no back holds, you know. Then we finally go to, then we have the deuce game on Daniel's serve at five wall. Novak is pressing him again once more. 
Daniel's not found wanting. I thought he did a great job to hold on there. Yeah. So we go to that 5-6 game, and then I want to discuss with you about the set point because mm. Novak served. There was the ad court serve and volley, and I thought the serve was perfectly placed on the tee. So pretty Daniel obviously anticipated it well enough because he made a decent return, not a great return, but Novak has, is playing the serve and volley, angles the back end volley cross court, but not quite as much as he wanted. A little more angle might have point might have been over because Daniel's so far back. But it does pull Daniel off the court. And obviously McEnroe, I heard later, I didn't wasn't listening to it at the time, but I heard it on my DVR later when I got home. And he was very critical of Daniel, as as were others that I know. For not going down the line, it seemed like there was a lot of space available down the line. Although we, but my feeling is we'll never know whether De Novak might, you know, if he, if he'd first of all, if he'd sensed that Daniel was going to go down the line, he would have been starting to edge over to that side. And secondly, no, he just stayed home because he did think he outwitted him. He obviously thought Daniel would go across court or hoped he would, and then he makes the volley to the open court. And he did smile as he walked back to the baseline. That's because he knew. You know, yes, there was a chance that Daniel might have ripped one down the line. He's going over the higher part of the net if he tries that. He's he's off the court. It was not. It wasn't a simple passing shot in my view, given where Dan standing. Uh, you know, just edging outside the alley. Your thoughts? Yeah, I, I've been thinking about this a lot. Like, I, I think I think part of it is also like Daniel hits those cross court a lot. Like most of the time, he prefers the cross court over the down the line. Yeah, and why not? Because it's a higher percentage play. Like you were saying, it's you know, down the line is the higher part of the, of the net. It's just, it's just more difficult, uh, more more difficult to go there. And I think he thought that Novak was going to cover it, so he tried to, he tried to go cross court. The problem was is that he he kind of hit it right at Djokovic, and it was, and Djokovic just had to stay home basically, and then just use his good reflexes. But I feel like Djokovic also does his homework, and he knows the patterns of his opponents. And so yeah. he, he, I think he would have known that Daniil would want to go cross there, and so he smartly stayed home. And yeah, exactly. Well, I think we, we're in a court. We're in a court. I'm just saying I wouldn't be as critical as McEnroe was of Daniel. I don't think it yeah. was such so simple at that spur of the moment. The the volley's low and angled off the court. You, you know, you don't have a lot of time to think. You got to make us. Was I think if it was like an Andy Murray in that situation, I think he would have lobbed him. But that's you know, and I think some yeah. other players would have gone for the lob. But it, but that's you know, that's not a very high percentage play. Either. No, listen, it took Kats for Djokovic to go in on that point. He obviously yeah. made it by look, this is what I'm gonna do. And he and he and he uh he deserves credit, I think, for attacking on such a big point, which he was yeah. willing to do twice in the tie break, two in the deuce court where he served in volley. But I but I think that uh it, I just don't think it was I think some people are being just a little too critical of, of Daniel for not going down the line. And I don't think it was that simple and Bottom line is Djokovic outthought him, and he, he read the play. And as you said, he's done his homework. He always does, and he was there in position. He played the volley very safely down the line, down down the middle slash line, and wins the point. Uh, you know, and that was critical, obviously, to get to the tie break. Then I thought that the tie break was just fascinating because Daniel played a, such a great first point, kept hammering the forehand cross court, and Djokovic kind of leaning the other way, and finally he hits the winner. It was a good start for him, and then then he and then Novak missed it, a little surprisingly off his backhand, a little bit off balance, and next thing you know, he's he's down two up three one, and then he made Novak made that good return that kind of rushed Daniel into a down the line for him, netted error, so that got Novak back in, serving at two three. He played the two good points on his serve, and then I thought Daniel did very well to win his two. Novak missed a doubt that down the line for him. There was an opening, but it was not an easy shot. It was not a terrible miss. He just tried and, and hit it long. And I, I think it was the right choice. He just didn't couldn't quite land it. And then the four all point where where Novak's defended and defended and then put himself in the, on the on the aggressive side and tried that little angled back end drop. And Daniel answered with the redrop and the crowd went wild. That was a that was a Daniel was, I think Novak just was not having much success with the drop shot the whole match, frankly, yeah, because Daniel was quick and onto it and getting to it. And, and he moves forward surprisingly well. And so that, that now puts Medvedev up 5-4. And that to me was the most impressive part 
Those are the most impressive two points of the match to me from Djokovic, far and away. Because you're serving at 4-5, you don't win that point, you're down double set point. It could be real trouble. And they have that long rally, and the last six shots of the rally were all backhand cross-court. It was a backhand cross-court duel. And I love the way Novak, with each and every backhand, they got a little better, a little bit more on them. Pace, angle, depth, it was all there. So he finally managed to get Medvedev stretching, and, and he, Daniel missed that down the line that never really had a chance. You know, landed short, and it was, it was almost as good as a winner. But I thought it was, you know, it, Djokovic was determined that he was, you know, they were going to win that point. And the execution on the back end was excellent. And he knew he couldn't just steer it cross court. He couldn't play it safely. He had to really be aggressive but within reason, and that's exactly what he did. So I thought that was a terrific point. And then, of course, he had the guy serving volley at 5 all. He didn't have to play the volley because Daniel missed the the down-the-line return. Those two points I thought were so critical and so clutch. And then Daniel finally cracks when he missed the the down-the-line back in at 5-6. And that, to me, is that settled everything. That was the match right there, those three points. But the first two from Djokovic I thought were outstanding. Yeah, um, it was also like one miss from Daniil at three one into the net. Yeah, but hand, I and that, I, I felt like that one. I thought I no, I think Djokovic's return got yeah, back. It was, out of it, was, it was quite deep. For sure. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think I think that's that's fair. Yeah, uh, for sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean that third set, like just, I mean, I mean that second set, like once Djokovic won that set, you got a feeling that the third set was going to be. Fairly routine, although to Medvedev's credit, he did uh, he didn't manage to break back, and then uh, and but then he lost his serve again, and I felt like in the, I felt like he did well to hold a two five, and yes. just ask the question yeah. of Djokovic to serve it out. Yeah, um, all 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 true what you just said. Yeah, I mean because Novak got a pretty easy break to go up three one, then played his worst game of the match at three one. You know, knew it. You know, just errors, double faults, just a bad game all around. He was frustrated by missing, only making one first serve. But then, you know, Daniel serving a 30 love in the next game. And Djokovic made a pretty remarkable four in return, very deep, that coaxed an error. Then he ends up coming back. He gets a back end down the line winner, and he and he gets the break. So that that was very important, though, that he got the break right back because at 4 2, he played a great game on his serve. And then, it, as you said, Daniel did well. Two five, love thirties, lost ten points in a row. And yet, you know, he wins the next point with a great serve and then looked like Djokovic had him on the volley point. But Daniel, but it Novak kind of came into no man's land and missed the volley. He was not quite sure whether he wanted to come in or stay back, but he really had him off the court with his forehand. And that was good. And then Daniel wins the next two points. You're right. And makes him serve it out. And then that was one of the few times. The last game serving for the match, Djokovic. Tried the serve and volley in the deuce court, didn't get it wide enough, and Daniel made an excellent forehand return winner cross court to put him down at level 15. So I, I, it was very professional from Daniel, the way he fought in the end, but obviously Djokovic was able to hold at 30. And yeah, there was an inevitability about that third set. Even even this would said that. It wasn't a question. It was just a question of how long is it going to take, uh, you know, if that was too jarring to lose that second set. Plus, Daniel, at that by that stage, is seemed to be having some soreness in his left shoulder. They rubbed his shoulder a lot at, at the changeover, and he seemed to be complaining to his camp at stages in that third. You know, that I so I I don't doubt that there was some pain there. So you take all of that, and most most notably the pain of losing the second set, and that knowing that you're going to have to win three sets from that stage of the match against Novak. That was uh, that was too much for Medvedev to handle, but I I do think Vance is one of the one of the best played sets I've seen in an open final, you know, yeah. you, you know not just that it was a tiebreaker, hard hard fought, terrific rallies, strategic acumen from Djokovic, it was all there, overcoming his fatigue. The, the second set was obviously the the uh, the standout set of the final is what made it special. Without that, it wouldn't have been. But that second set was just such a war, and the outcome of it was so important to both players because Novak would also not have liked being at once at all and having to think about playing three more hours himself. That would have not been fun. So 
you knew what was going through their minds. You could read their minds. Yeah, that's very well put. I think uh, one other, couple of other things about this match is I'm really wondering what would have happened if Medvedev won the, won the second set because um, I think Djokovic would have probably found a second win and he probably would have been, would have come out on top anyway. But I just feel like, uh, you know, there were times in that in, in that second set and throughout the whole match where Medvedev was not hitting the ball from the baseline with the same conviction, let's say, that he was against Alcaraz and freedom. And I feel like he was allowing Djokovic to dictate more than he would have liked. And he was maybe at times a little bit too passive from the baseline, like in, in terms of in terms of the same injections of pace that we saw from him against Carlos. He just wasn't able to do that against Djokovic. And I think maybe that Alcaraz match just took a lot out of him. Not as much physically, maybe, but I, I mean, to some degree physically as well, but I, but also just emotionally and just knowing that he was going to have to play like that again. It's just, Good you know, boy. yeah, it's, yeah. you know, it kind of reminded me of like a 2015 Wimbledon situation where Federer played one of his top 10 best matches of his career against Andy Murray. And, you know, plenty of experts and players were giving him a very good chance in the final. And then he comes up against against Djokovic and, you know, it's a completely different story. And and Djokovic is able to problem solve his way through that one and four. So I think yeah, it's, no. just, it's just tough to do it back to back. It is. No, that's a good it's a good analogy because Djokovic, uh, Federer that day in 15 against Murray on one, one of the great serving days of his career too. And it was a gem. And I remember my friend John Barrett of the BBC was, was he was one who thought that that Roger was going to have a good chance of the final. And he, and 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 one of my colleagues said something to him about, but, but, but this is Djokovic, this isn't Murray. And he says, yeah, but how does he get that serve back? Well, of course, he got it back and then some. And mm -hmm. so, uh, yeah, but but you're right, because in this case, in each, each case, it's coming off of a, a, a very satisfying semifinal win, and you don't want to feel that way at the semi. You want to feel you're building towards something. And yeah, I think emotionally, maybe, maybe, Maybe that was a bit drained. It's it's very possible that might explain the start of the match for sure. But yeah. then obviously he made a monumental effort to turn it around at the second set, and he played much 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 better. I just think the pattern and the fabric of the rallies, if I may put it that way, it's different. That yes. Carlos is going to Carlos is going to. There are times when Carlos is going to go or he's going to miss. It's just it's not as taxing. And I think Daniel knows that. And Novak takes the initiative in those rallies and outmaneuvers him. And I, I can see why he played the way he did too, because I've seen it in other matches against Novak too, where Novak is the one to pounce and Novak is the one to start. And Daniel's on defense and has to try to do it that way. I don't know. But I do agree that there was some, yeah, it, it, emotionally he may, he, he'd been through a lot to win it. Hard fought. I don't think physically, I think he was fine. Yeah. But I think it was more mental, more emotional coming off a win of, uh, of that magnitude. So it was asking a lot that he then comes and, uh, and then beats Djokovic in the final to follow. But I just, I, I, I think Djokovic is just that little bit better as well. Don't you? I mean, he, yeah, I think so. From the back. He, 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 go ahead. No, no, I, I wasn't really going to add anything. I think, yeah. I, I think I definitely agree with you. He's just, just, uh, just more complete and overall as a as a player, and just has more more options he can go to. Quite frankly, and yeah, but it was entertaining. The second set was very entertaining. The tension was building. I was watching with a lot of you know the everybody in the press box was amazed by it too, and you you just knew it. it and you could just feel it was almost palpable how much each guy wanted that set and and what it was going to mean. And and I agree with you, by the way. I think Djokovic would have. There might have been a little lull early in the third had he lost that second, but that he would have he would have bounced back physically and emotionally, and 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 gotten back on top of things and probably won a tight four setter and might have even gone five. But I think he would have won. Uh, but he didn't want to have to deal with that kind of a situation and. And who can blame, you know, you, it's the last thing you need because the the physicality of his matches with Medvedev, to me, it's like, it's like no other matchup for him. Yeah. I mean, yes, Carlos, obviously they exhausted each other in Cincinnati for nearly four hours, but there are, there are lulls here and there. There are times when, when Carlos is going to be explosive that 
go for it early in a point or when Carlos is going to play a serve and volley point, which Daniel never does. And Carlos does that in the ad court against Novak at times and did so in Cincinnati where, you know, the point's over and and that so rarely happens. Yes, Daniel's going to win. So Daniel's going to serve a few aces and service winners, but otherwise it's just an all-out brutal war. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. There's some of those exchanges, like 30, 40 shot rallies over time, it's, yeah, it's it gets really, really physical. That's one of the most physical sets you can ever think of in a in a major final where we just where we just Yeah, and obviously the hour and forty four, a lot of that had to do with so many of those three, four deuce games that they were having. Uh plus a, a lengthy and left tie break, you know, at seven five. So that's a that's a ton of points. And and they you know, I, I think they both you know, I think it's more obvious that Joker. I think Daniel hides it better than Novak. Novak at times when he would lose a long point would be slumped over. But I, I feel that that was, it, it wasn't just physical, it was mental, emotional for him in the sense of, oh God, I gave so much at that point. I, why, you know, he just, he's more expressive. But I think Daniel's feeling it more than we know after some of the long points. He just, he's, he's just in a lower key. Yeah. Um, and, and as far as Djokovic goes with this number 24, um, you know, there's just no sign of how really slowing down in terms of in terms of his efficiency at the top of the game. Like I, I, I think I think obviously he doesn't have the stamina that he used to have. And he's maybe not as quick around the court and as as, as explosive as he maybe was five five to ten years ago, of course. But I think he it's just his tennis IQ is so much better. His his match management is a lot better. His his serve and his net game just keep evolving and his point shortening skills are are so useful. I mean this serving serving and volley that he's been doing I mean, it's not the first time that we've seen it, really, because he he showcased it very well in the 2021 Paris Masters final, and uh, and in, in some other matches against Daniel too. But I just, I just think uh, he still has all the all, all the skills. It's just a question of how long can he actually keep this level up uh, in in the next couple of years. And I think next year he'll just be very motivated for the Olympics, and even more so for every major. Yeah, I, I agree. And he'll be picking his spots. And I think he saw that the scheduling, he can he can reduce the schedule and, can, and it can really work. I mean, just the one tournament, just Cincinnati, he went there thinking maybe just two or three matches would get him ready and he wins the tournament, which helped. But it's like, no, he's not going to, you're not going to see him play both events over the summer. You're not going to see him play too many, too many clay court tournaments leading up to Roland Garros. This fall, he'll pick his spots. Yeah. That's what it's going to take. It's just less less tournaments and be as effective as he can and in, in, as inspired as he can for the for the big ones. And boy, the formula sure worked this year because you said at the outset, you know, he you, he would have signed up for the three majors this year plus the Wimbledon final, and and that's really what he's going to be looking for the next two years. So I I do expect him to win at least three more majors before he's done. Uh, you know, I, I think, you know, over the next couple of years, that's going to happen. And no, is he going to win three next year and three the year after? Unlikely, but I, but certainly more. And, uh, and, and that's, that's really why, and I, and then just look to sort of leave on his terms at the end, leave when he's still playing well, but when he knows he just has nothing left to give. Yeah. That's a good way of putting it. And so Vaj, let's. Let's talk quickly about the women. I know you wanted to yeah. talk about the women. Yeah, for sure. Um, I, I mean, I just think uh, we walk away from this. It's it's just such a great story. I mean, obviously, you and I have followed Coco very, very closely since the breakout in 2019 and Indian Wells. And I mean, Wimbledon, not Indian Wells. <laughs> Wimbledon, where she beat Venus right. Williams uh, yeah. in, the, in the first round there. And then, you know, yeah. since then, and then we had the pandemic. And then we had a period of sort of, I guess you could stay you know, stagnation, really. I don't know if that's too harsh of a word, but really from the French Open all the way till the Wimbledon French Open final in 2022, all the way till the Wimbledon first round loss against Kennan. And then, of course, things start to change as she brings on, you know, Brad Gilbert to already para Reba, which she had before Wimbledon, but then they go on this 18-1 and run together and she wins DC and a tough three-set loss to Pegula and the Porters in Canada and then wins Cincinnati and then beating Sviantec along the way, which I thought was really big. And then also at the U.S. Open, this impressive display of, you know, four three-set matches that she had to win along with, uh, you know, obviously everything that was on the line in the final against Sabalenka and the way she was just able to use her speed and defense and win that match. I mean, it was just incredible. 
just incredible to to watch and obviously the maturity that she has for a 19 year old i mean it was just so impressive yeah you size it up well because look there's four three the four three set matches three comebacks from the set down she was very gritty a lot of gumption didn't necessarily play as as well as she did perhaps at times in washington or cincinnati but there was so much more pressure yeah but look just quickly i think it's no accident that this happened under Gilbert. You you you, yeah. you think back to 20 years ago when he started with Andy Rye and they started at Queens Club right before Wimbledon and he saves a match point against Agassi, wins the tournament, semis of Wimbledon, loses to a top-of-the-line veteran. Next thing you know, he's won five out of seven tournaments, including the U.S. Open, where he saved a match point against Albandian in the semis. So, I mean, he, we started with... with, with Agassi in 94 and had, had great success with him immediately too. And Andre won the U.S. Open unseated. So it's, there's just something about his psyche and his mentality and his outlook and his positivity. It's just all there. And and so I think Coco has really benefited. Yes, she got a little bit annoyed a few times at thought Brad was talking too much during the matches, but they'll sort that out. And I'm sure he's going to say to her, look, you, you, uh, you take as much as you want. I'm going to say what I think I need to say, and you absorb what you want, but I'm, I'm here to help you. And she knows that. And I just thought that was very impressive in the final. Sabalenka hit her off the court in the first set. You you touched on the, 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 the chief reason why she came through, because the speed, you know, once she held from 1540 in the second, for opening game second set, and she'd served a couple of doubles and it was not looking good. Getting out of that game, she seemed to get faster and faster. There just seemed to be no ball that Sabalenka could get out of her reach. And yes, yeah, so then naturally Sabalenka starts pressing some too. But Coco, the, you know, the core coverage was just astounding over the last two sets. And the next thing you know, from nearly getting broken at the start of the second, she's up 4-1 and she, she wins that 6-3. And then she gets a 4 love lead in the third. And even though Sabalenka won the next two games, you felt like Coco would close her in. And she did just that. So... I, I thought it was a great tournament, but I think she set the stage for some big things in the years ahead. This puts her to three in the world, and I think she'll, she'll maybe maybe she can. I don't think she'll finish the year number one, but I think next year she's got a shot at number one. And uh, this was a major turnaround in her career, and I think she's going to be great for the game. Still needs more work on the forehand. There were times when the forehand a little shaky, like in the semifinals, <clears throat> but. Um, she she's got a better sense of when to sort of rein it in and and loop it and roll it and keep herself in the point with it too. And I think that that's a ch there's a chance for her and Gilbert to work on that over the course of the fall when the results are not going to be quite as important. Yes, she wants to do well in the year end championships, even try to win that. But they could spend some time on the court really looking at that forehand and and uh, dissecting it. But to be able to do this well despite that issue is remarkable and she's got a great backhand great great serve and her second serve now is much yeah she served a few doubles against Sabalenka and that was tight at times but overall she doesn't serve doubles the way she used to uh in clusters and now I I I, I think there's a big upside I don't think she's even that I don't think she's that close to her, her zenith yet I think there's a she can improve another 20 25 percent yeah, I totally agree. And I think Andy Roddick had this great line about Gilbert that he just makes really complicated things in tennis look easy in terms of his messaging and delivering of them. And I think that's that's probably one thing that uh, that she's really benefited from, just like having that clarity on court, uh, you know, under Gilbert. Because, yeah, I mean, you're such on it, like the improved first serve. She's, she hits that shot so big. And then she's also going back on the second serve returns, getting more loop on them and... Uh, and she's always had the great backhand speed and defense, and it's just, it's just going to be a nightmare to, for for the other top players, I think, to, to play her, especially if that forehand, even you know, like you were saying, gets ten, fifteen percent better, and it's a good opportunity to, to work on it, you know, in the fall after having already won this major, and the pressure's kind of off her shoulders a bit, and uh, you know, she can, she can just improve, improve her game that much more, I think. Um, well, listen, Vanch, it's been a lot of fun as always. We we could probably talk for. Three or yeah. four um, I've enjoyed this immensely, and I enjoyed the open a lot, and I know you did as well. And uh, we, we, it, uh, we're both going to be a little down in the dumps to have to wait all the way to Australia for another major. Yeah, 
Yeah, certainly. It's always a pleasure, Steve. It's it's one of the highlights of uh, of of my day every single time we we do this after every after every major. So I already look forward to the next one. Yeah, stay here, Vaj. Thanks. Thanks again for having me. Yeah, th thanks. Thanks a lot, Steve.